just want to say hello again to everyone who's joining us. We're just going to give it a couple more minutes before we get started. Okay, I think you're good to start things off, Lillian. Lillian. Awesome, yes. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and welcome to Montpurg's conversation on civic engagement in a civil society with Denise Juno. My name is Lillian King. I'm a board member of Montpurg and I will be your host this evening. Um, to recap, Montpurg is the Montana Public Interest Research Group and it's a student directed and funded nonpartisan organization dedicated to affecting tangible positive change through educating and empowering the next generation of civic leaders. For 40 years, we have trained the next generation of leaders providing young people with opportunities to learn valuable citizenship skills through work on public policy. Our goal is to help students become informed and equipped with the knowledge, skills, and confidence to advocate for the public interest. Montpurg began with a petition drive in 1981, students at the University of Montana formed an organizing co committee to collect signatures to establish Montpurg. The drive was successful and Montpurg has not stopped organizing since. We are also happy to report that some of these ambitious folks from the original position, petition drive are still involved in Montpurg to this day. Over the past 40 years, Montpurg has been involved in some of Montana's most important political, um, political campaigns. In the 1980s, Montpurg worked to pass Montana's Lemon Law and in 1988 conducted its first statewide campaign qualifying a refundable bottle bill for the ballot. In the 90s, Montpurg continued its work on ballot initiatives, including those that sought to limit campaign condition, contributions and strengthen water quality standards. Montpurg has also represented students at the state legislature and in the aughts, Montpurg and its allies worked to pass the renewable energy standard at the Montana legislature. Throughout all of our 40 years, Montpurg has registered thousands of voters and distributed our tenant landlord guide, which provides renters with information on their rights in the rental market. Most importantly to our mission, Montpurg has trained students with the skills to organize and affect change in their communities. We encourage you to check out www.mtperg.org to see our 40 leaders for 40 years, to learn more about the Montpurg leaders who have made a difference in Montana across the country. This presentation today is being recorded by the Missoula Community Access Television as part of a media assistance grant donated to our organization by MCAT. MCAT is Missoula's community media resource. Their mission is to promote the spread of information and exchange of views, ideas, and opinions within the community of Missoula by providing channel time, equipment, and training to as many organizations as people and people as they humanly can. Please give, please give some clap reacts on Zoom for the MCAT streaming crew. Woo! Tonight, we are here to talk to Denise Stierno, the former superintendent of public instruction in Montana, the first Native American woman to win statewide office in Montana, and the first openly LGBTQ person to run for federal office in Montana. We are hosting this event tonight as part of our 40th anniversary celebration to learn more about the importance of political engagement and what it looks like in Montana, as it becomes more crucial for people to come together in this sphere. We hope that you enjoy this event, and if you have any questions for Denise Stierno, please put them in the chat. We will be doing audience questions at the end of the night tonight. Our moderator for tonight is Audrey Dozier, another one of our board members and a junior here at the University of Montana. They are pursuing a bachelor's degree in biology with a computer science minor. They interned with Montpurg last fall before joining the board and in the last year have proven themselves an all around cool person. Take it away, Audrey. Thank you, Lillian, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Denise, for being here tonight. Um, I guess we'll just start off with some questions. We're going for around four minutes each, so feel free to just uh, really dive into your answers with these. And so first off, we have 
Uh, when did you first get started in civic engagement and who opened the door to that participation for you? Yeah, well, thanks Montperg for this opportunity. Um, super important conversations to be had, particularly um, I think as we talk more throughout the next uh, hour or so that we'll see that there's just a lot of dialogue that needs to happen. It needs to happen across party lines. It needs to happen across uh, race. It needs to happen across generations. And so anytime that we can have these types of conversations, it's super important. So I just appreciate the time and effort Montperg's putting in and congratulations on 40 years. Um, so I sort of was always involved in civic engagement. My parents um, very early on I grew up registering voters um, and going to community events and tabling with my parents. And my mom always had voter registration cards and learned a lot about um, access early on. Like I remember my parents fighting for voting rights um, up on the Blackfeet Reservation. And there was a time when you go to the clerk and recorder, you had to travel 30 miles to Cut Bank from Browning to the Glacier uh, County headquarters and pick up 10 voter registration cards. That's what they would give you. You had to go take those, go get them filled out, bring them back, pick up 10 more. And so when you saw early on uh, uh, growing up, kind of those types of barriers that get put in place um, to stifle the vote, um, particularly for those that you are advocating for and that you that really do need a voice at, at the ballot box, it became super important um, to make sure that we were civically engaged in doing that work and that, you know, that eventually got changed over time, but it takes a little extra effort when those barriers get <clears throat> put into place. And so I grew up that way. Um, my parents were always involved in public education. I kind of followed a lot of footsteps. My grandmother was a school cook for 28 years. My grandfather was a school bus driver. We learned very early on to advocate for people. I know that I was a privileged person growing up in my community um, with both my parents having um, jobs and, and being college educated. And so we really took that seriously as well. Um, my dad ran for tribal council, served on the tribal council. Um, he served on the school board when he was done being, um, when he was retired as the superintendent there. He ran for county commission. My mom served in the state legislature. And so there was always this idea in our family that um, we had to be super community-based, family-focused, and that we would do everything that we could with the privilege and power that we were given to make sure that others followed along and that we kept the ladder down for the next generation to follow in, in whatever steps that we were taking. And so my civic engagement started super early. Um, I was involved in a lot of the efforts my parents were involved in and kind of followed their lead um, all along the way for my career. Wonderful. Yeah. So it seems like that progression to uh, run for statewide office was a natural progression in that. Um, so uh, what was it like talking to voters across Montana and what did you find to be the hardest part of campaigning? And in contrast to that, what was the most re uh, rewarding? Yeah. And I think, you know, I went to law school mid-career basically because when I saw my mom at the legislature and she was the first American Indian woman to serve in the state Senate, and just her ability to rise up on the floor and advocate for those in her community and actually get really good policy done. You know, I was working at the Office of Public Instruction at the time and just became super interested in that area where policy and politics intersect and the kinds of um, good things that could happen as a result of being engaged and particularly in an elected position. And so, when um, I graduated law school, I did, I, I practiced law for a minute, and then I went back to the Office of Public Instruction to run the Division of Indian Education at that time. And the state superintendent um, position, we have term limits in this state, um, was termed out, and so it was an open seat. And so I ran, I talked to a lot of people about it, I weighed my pros and cons, and a lot of people said, why don't you run for school board or why don't you run for state legislature? Because um, everybody wants you to sort of earn your way. And it's like, I don't want to do those jobs. I want to be the state superintendent. And so, um, you know, I talked with some friends and we 
you know, figured we could get the support. I ran a four-way primary, my first race, and was fortunate to come through there. And I think a hard part of that is when you're in a primary, it's super hard. I mean, because you're running against people who have similar values, who are in it for the same reason, who often have the same types of policy ideas. And so trying to navigate your way through that um, is really difficult, particularly when you have, you know, like I was on the Democratic side. And so just talking with Democrats a lot, and there were four of us, and how do you distinguish yourself um, and make sure that people are picking up on your ideas to get elected? And then you switch over to a general election and it becomes a little bit harder um, just because there are um, other issues that, that come up that you need to navigate as well. So I think, you know, and then stepping up into the congressional race when I ran in 2016, stepping from up from a statewide race into a federal race was a huge lift. It was very, very different than I thought it was going to be. Um, way more intense, a lot more spotlight on, on um, what we were doing, you know, all, all the things, the negativity, the negative TV ads came, all those things. And I think that that was really hard. And you get, I mean, as a candidate, you're sort of prepared for that because you do all these trainings, you go to talk with a lot of people, but it's the people around you who love you, your family, your friends who see the negative ads on TV. I think that really impacts them a lot more because they know that is not who you are. Um, and also, I think just, uh, you know, traveling around the state was both exhilarating and exhausting, but also an awesome part of getting to know, like, every back road in the state, talking with people at, you know, every forum that we could have, you know, at public libraries, we had meet and greets and parks, and just getting to understand not just one location, not one geographic area, but the entire state, um, having great debates with people about policy. And I think what's really important is when you get around the state, and we can probably talk about this a little later too, um, you kind of come to an understanding about people's lived experience, particularly that is different from yours. And, you know, visiting with farmers and ranchers, um, that was not my experience, but visiting with them about their issues and um, how people in elected office can um, support them and to help to continue on to keep it, the family farm in, in their um, in, in the next generation is, is super important. And so it was just things like that, I think were really important. And I will add, even after losing that race, I would say that um, I'm still glad I did it. It was super hard. It was super busy. It was exhausting. And even today, like I will go, you know, after right after the election, my partner and I went and um, had lunch at a restaurant and this lady left and she left a little note and I still have it. And it said, you know, as a Thank you so much for running, that she was a lesbian woman and that she, for the first time had ever seen somebody running in a race that reflected her and her lived experience and how meaningful that was to her. And so even though I am not serving in Congress, that I think being present in those spots and those uh, and seeing people who, who are running for office with good ideas, but who also, um, you know, as a native woman, as a, as a lesbian woman um, running for office, I think seeing that reflected um, in a candidate was super important to people across the state. And I just, um, I'm st still honored when I travel, particularly into Indian country and people are still thankful for that run. And it opens doors for the next person to walk through. And I had uh, good talks with both Deb Holland and um, Sharice Davis, when they won Congress, they were the first Native women elected to Congress ever. And, you know, they thanked me for helping them see themselves in that place. And so it does, it is super important um, when young people step into the, step up to the plate as well and put themselves on the ballot. And for young people, I think that's pretty exhilarating. And so both raising money, always hard, um, raising money and you know you have to call cold call people you don't know and ask them to give to you that's super hard um, to learn to do that and then um, but then you realize you have to kind of put yourself like they are not giving to you as a person they're giving to your ideas 
to your campaign, to the policy that you want to enact. And so um, just the learning experience was great. Raising money was hard, but I think people's reactions was, uh, is really, um, was, was a great honor afterwards. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself for a second, um, but that's really wonderful, um, especially that you have those memories of certain places around the state where people really uh, saw, found your impact and really felt that. Um, so moving on to the next question, I guess, uh, statewide offices in Montana are often, often traded back and forth between Democrats and Republicans, and you ran in one as a Democrat. Um, so when that election season ended, what was it like working with elected officials across the aisle to implement good public policy? Yeah, no, that is, you know, people run elections, they get elected. And once you are elected, um, you know, the job actually really does start. You win and then you step into office and you have to really start governing. And so building a good team was always super important to start out. You have to put super smart people around you. Um, who kind of have networks of their own and um, know how to build coalitions. So, um, you know, when I first stepped into office, I reached out to every legislator in the state. I at least wrote them a letter and congratulated them and said I look forward to working. And when I could make calls like I did, just try to establish relationships. And I do think that right now when we <clears throat> think about our politics, it is much more divided than when I was first elected a state superintendent. Um, you know, our former president really has made it a space where the truth is, doesn't matter much anymore in, in politics and the disinformation that gets thrown around. Um, so it's a different sort of political world than when I was first elected. Um, when, you know, I could walk up to the legislature and I could sit with uh, people from the other side of the aisle and have conversations about policy. Um, one thing I think that I would point out when I was state superintendent, we had an initiative called Graduation Matters Montana, mm -hmm. and everything was focused on raising graduation rates, um, and we were super successful. We had the, we raised it to historic highs two years in a row once it got going, but we made sure that all the work across the agency um, was focused on that. Our messages to the schools and communities um, was about Graduation Matters. We worked with philanthropy and of course it was part of our legislative agenda um, and we worked in a very community-based manner which is very different for a state agency that we really dove in and, and worked with community coalitions all across the state. Um, philanthropy provided us flexible dollars so we could grant that money out to community groups made up of schools, small businesses and local organizations um, and then also as the state superintendent, I thought it was really important that we listen to young people. And so I started the first ever superintendent student advisory board with students from all across the state. And they became really a key part of Graduation Matters Montana, which helped when we went to the legislature, right? And so being able to uh, work on school funding issues and all the things that are the normal sort of legislative agenda um, between OPI, the Office of Public Instruction, and the legislature um, was, uh, was good. And um, I had a bill, I brought a bill several times to rate, right now the state of Montana is still this way, has a graduation age that says you can drop out when you're 16 or you finish eighth grade. And so we thought it was important to at least raise the expectation at a state level that everybody should be 18 or graduate from high school. And we had a lot of caveats in there to get your GED, to do all kinds of different types of, of things um, that for, unfortunately never passed, mm -hmm. but we were able to bring along people from the other side by really honing in on our why. This is why we're doing it. This is why it's important. Um, you know, I had Democrat, carry it one year and then actually Taylor Brown, a Republican carried it one year during the legislative session. Um, and I just think it was a time when it was possible to work across the aisle, get policy at least discussed at the legislature, um, but had to be willing to sit and talk it through and really you know, do the compromise that's necessary to make good policy and good legislation. 
Um, so we had great conversation, great debate um, in all the committees. And I, we got a chance to work across the aisle, which I think is super important um, and was a really good model for particularly the students who were on the student advisory board to see people can come together and at least work towards good policy. Mm -hmm. And that's that does seem to be a shift from what we have now. It's certainly much more divided. And we see that the media market and politics is saturated with a lot of negative rhetoric and often just blatant disinformation. Uh, which brings us to our next question, actually. Uh, how can young people best inform themselves about what's actually uh, going on in politics and how can civic leaders make good information more accessible? Yeah, this is a super important question and one that I think that all of us probably kind of need to think through because it is, I mean, it's hard to sift through information that's out there right now. And social media, you know, doesn't not help with that where, you know, you can't have real dialogue through um, tweets and, you know, Facebook posts, but that's really where people are having um, conversations, it seems like, instead of actually, you know, picking up a phone or having a coffee or doing something where you can actually at least have real dialogue and then sit and just listen, right? Listen for understanding. A lot of that doesn't happen. There's just a lot of arguments that fly around. And so I think this is really one, a key issue that everybody across generations really need to think about how we're going to really get the truth and, and figure out real information and where do we go for that? If I had the answer, you know, I would definitely um, be putting it out there, but it is a really hard, hard um, issue right now for all of us to be grappling with. I do think, you know, groups like Montperg, there are other organizations out there that um, can access elected officials, that can pull together forums, that um, talk to people who are in power. And so for young people joining groups like Montperg, I think is super important where there is access to people that you can ask directly um, questions to that you might have. Um, I would also say one, another way to kind of get a view um, into things is to, to work on campaigns, work for elected officials, um, work for nonpartisan groups on voter registration and just talk to people about what their issues are. Um, and then, um, you know, like I said, we had the student advisory board and finding paths for young people to be supported in these conversations at decision making tables. That is one way I think that um, that elected officials and people who are in seats of leadership can help um, find places for young people to have a voice directly with them. Um, it's important, so, I mean, people should be reaching out to young people on a consistent basis. It's also important to put good information where young people are. Um, so like, for example, in Seattle, when I was the superintendent there, we also had a student advisory board and we would, you know, put together email lists and put these out there. And finally we asked them, it's like, how do you access information? And it was through their, um, their student, um, uh, council sort of Instagram posts kinds of things. And so then we had a different channel that we could communicate on a broader scale with the young people in our district. And so a lot of times it, it's just important, I think for elected officials and people in leadership to ask young people, where do you get your information? How do you find it? And then put good information that is truthful and accurate and relevant um, out to them. But we, we have a ways to go until we get to that point. Wonderful. Uh, and I guess with that too, that really leads into our next question very well. Uh, what barriers, barriers do young people face that hinder their level of civic engagement? Uh, how can leaders in elected office help break down those barriers to improve democratic participation? Yeah, and it is a lot of what we were talking about. I think disinformation that it leads to apathy and sort of disempowerment of being active and engagement. Um, and policy, you know, sort of that hinders voter registration and access to voting is really dangerous. Um, for example, that the new law, I think that does not allow voter registration organizations to knock on dorm doors um, to get young people registered. That is not, that's throwing barriers into the path of being able to access the ballot box where you can really get your voice heard. Um, I also think that leads 
more and more, you know, the disinformation that leads to apathy and disempowerment, and then the policy that comes out that provides blocks and barriers to young people voting, um, lowers voter, voter turnout for young people. And when, voter, when young people aren't voting in the numbers that they are capable of voting, politicians, you know, we look at numbers during a campaign and we go where the votes are. And if young people voted in large numbers and didn't have those barriers, um, I think politicians and elected officials would be a lot more present um, with that demographic. Um, leaders right now, they can help create policy that provide more access and take down barriers to voting rather than decreasing that access. Um, they could show up um, to hold forums and round tables with young people on issues that they care about. Um, and again, it goes back to that listening about what's important and, and what can we do as leaders to make sure that young people are having the access that they need. Um, they can vet their policy ideas with young people to find out how you all think about, um, think about their policy ideas and how it will impact your lived experience. I don't think enough of that happens. I think people get these ideas of what's important. Um, without asking. I remember one time when I was superintendent, we were in a community and talking with students and we asked, we had these community meetings and we were asking everybody like, what, what needs to happen for change in the school? And people had ideas about, well, we need this type of curriculum or we want these types of books in our library and we need, you know, teachers with these types of skills. And then we sat with 10th graders and said, what do you need in your community to make you successful? And they said sidewalks. Like that was something they said, we want, want safe places to walk in our community. And nowhere on any adult agenda was that, um, that idea. And so I think it is important for people in leadership to really talk with those that we want to most impact um, so that they can inform the leaders about what is important to them so that those should then become the policy issues that we work on if, if that is defined by the population that you want to impact. And so there are, um, I, I think that is one place that, that can have, like it's pretty easy to pull together a round table of different demographics and young people are no different to hear their voices. I, I think that's really interesting that you pointed out the sidewalks. It's those, those things that you wouldn't really expect to uh, be so impactful, but uh, they certainly make a difference, especially for students who have to walk to school every day. Um, and I just want to give a little shout out to Montford. We are actually challenging that bill that you mentioned, uh, SB 319, I believe, about um, registering voters in the dorms. Um, so uh, uh, you've already mentioned a couple of things related to our last question. Um, and which is uh, hyperpartisanship and gridlock have burned a lot of people out of engaging in politics. Uh, how do we as a culture uh, begin to combat the idea that civic engagement is pointless and yields no tangible results? Yeah, it's, that's like the question of the decade, I think, is that we need to really, where are we going and how are we going to get there? And I do think we all have at least a lot of people I talk to, I mean, I also think, you know, you can get the news that you want to right now, right? You can listen to news pundits that you want that align with you. You can be, you can friend or unfriend people who think like you on social media and you can go to get things that align. And, and oftentimes we're not sitting with people who don't think like us and, um, you know, I, and it is a lot of just the divisiveness right now. We're all watching these fights unfold, you know, fights at school boards about whether students should be masked or vaccinated, adults that are literally, literally standing in front of schools as kids walk in or in school board offices yelling at each other. Um, we watch our congressional leaders struggle to accomplish anything. Um, we watch people running for office block anyone who disagrees with them on social media. Um, we're just watching a lot of um, campaigns or people who are in leadership positions not uh, be willing to enter into a space of compromise or conversation even. Um, and that is really a dangerous place for our democracy. We watched what happened on January 6th and, and how we can't even um, get people 
um, indicted around that. And so there's just a lot that we need to overcome. Um, and it can be super scary to get engaged in an environment like that. Like nobody wants to be cussed at and yelled at. Um, and it's hard to have rational conversation about difficult issues when all anybody really wants to do is just yell their opinion at you. Um, but that is where we need to go. Uh, you know, I would once belonged to this group um, and it brought together people who were in elected positions. They could be in the state legislature, they could be auditors, they could be state superintendents, but sort of lower level elected office who they had identified across the country as might, running for, might run for Congress someday. And so they thought it was important to start these conversations while people were in a different type of elected office. So they brought together Republicans and Democrats and independents. And we had a lot of these classes and we all sat around and we had these readings about democracy and what it meant and back to the founding, foundation of democracy and other thought leaders about what government should be and how, how things should play out. And then we had conversations about readings. We didn't have conversations about policy. We didn't have conversations about campaign. We didn't have conversations, but we had good conversations about what does democracy mean and how should we all interplay with that? And um, some, you know, a lot of us did actually end up running for Congress. Some of them are in Congress now. Um, some became governors. But I think it was that commonality um, of at least being able to know that we sat with each other and had these conversations about important things um, that allow us to continue to have conversations across partisan lines. And I do think that is a space that we can get into. We're, I mean, Montana is actually you know, not a large state population wise and the ability to bring people together and convene is super important and we should do that across lines and not talk about you know the issues that divide us but what actually brings us together and so i mean it's just it's those types of experiences that i've been able to have that keep me optimistic um a little bit at least um and the, um you know throughout my career i worked with young people and and young people always inspire me they um you know, they're always, no matter what space they're in, they're hopeful too. And they will be the ones who change things. Um, you are all way more inclusive and accepting generation than the ones who came before you. Um, you're living through a pandemic. You have to find new ways to engage. Um, you're living through a national racial reckoning. Um, you're going to have to figure out your place in that and making our communities better for everybody. Um, you're bringing your best ideas forward, you're advocating for them, you're leading, you're protesting, you're doing all the things that are necessary to make change. Um, and eventually you will run for office. So you are the ones who are um, getting elected and having a say in what that means. And so, and, and, and how it is that we uh, progress as a society. And so it is really young people and experiences that I, I've had that I know what's possible. And I think that we can all continue that belief, but we're gonna have to work hard at it. Wonderful. I, I really love that you emphasize just having conversations and connecting with people and like what we do have in common um, because it just doesn't happen very often. Um, so with that, we're actually going to move on to the audience Q&A section. Uh, so we have a couple questions gathered from our audience. First off, I'm going to start with, what is your favorite news network and why? Oh, that's a good question. I actually, I read the New York Times in the mornings. And then I also, um, I kind of just watch local news um, in the evening over dinner and sort of the national news, but I don't dive too much into the cable news network. I don't have cable um, and, and kind of just try to stay more in the mainstream. Wonderful. I'm a big fan of the New York Times too. So I, I support that answer fully. <laughs> Um, another question from uh, Tor, who's our vice chair of the board. We have uh, from your time in statewide office or from now, who's your favorite Republican to work with? Oh, uh, well, that's a good question. I would just, I would point back to the, the, um, the example I gave earlier, Taylor Brown. I mean, he was not, he did not want to do it. And he got called out a lot from his colleagues when he uh, partnered with 
um, our agency. And so I just really respect his ability to see why that policy was important um, and to carry the bill. I mean, that was a big ask. Um, and he realized that and he knew that he would get flat for it and he did. Um, but he still completed and, you know, went through and talked to his colleagues and advocated for it. And, um, and, and I do, so I do still have great respect for Taylor Brown um, and the work that he did and we were able to accomplish together. Wonderful. Uh, next up we have, uh, what was your most memorable moment or a moment that you learned something from that you're willing to share uh, uh, from running for the DC government? Oh yeah. Okay. So like I, I got asked one time, like what, you know, looking at failure. And I do think, you know, that was a really big public failure. And, and at the end of the day, it really, I mean, I wouldn't define it as a failure, but I lost. Right. And so I think that there was real learning in that as far as you can put a lot of hard work in, you can gather coalitions, you can raise the money that's necessary and you can still lose. But I do think in that losing, you also gain so much. Um, and like I said, there was just a lot of people that got inspired by our campaign um, and being able to then, you know, look around and, and figure out, um, you know, that it matters and, and that that race still mattered. And what I will say is for gay Montanans, for native Montanans, um, that being present just even on the ballot, it mattered. And I, did, I think that is a real learning point is like oftentimes we step into positions of leadership and it's super, super hard and you have to work your butt off, but that things can still, good things can still come out of that. Yeah, I think that's a really wonderful point. And I think for myself personally, as a queer person, it's been really impactful just to be able to speak with you tonight and to have you as a public figure. So yeah, I remember one time like, and, and I think that's really important too, is like the GSA clubs and the mm -hmm. schools. Like I ran into a student as, as uh, I was actually running for Congress then and, and you know, being an out candidate, um, she was having difficulty in her rural school getting a GSA club going, not because of the kids, but because of the adults in the system. And so, you know, just being able to sit with her and talk through different options that might, uh, that she might follow um, the process and what, what actual, how to get things done within a school district. I mean, part of it is knowing how to do things and who to talk to in order to navigate the system. Um, so just, efforts like that um, and the conversations that I was able to have with a lot of people across the state that was, um, it was hopeful. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's really good to have that message of hope. And it, like, it's not that all hope is lost, even though we have this increased division, we still have things in common, even with yeah. people we disagree with. Mm -hmm. um, and actually that leads into another question from the audience. Uh, when talking with someone that you disagree with, how do you make sure that you're con you uh, continue to talk with one another and not uh, slip into an argument or a debate? Yeah, no, that's super hard. So I just, I, it's, it's making connection first. And I do think that when you go into spaces, you can create um, a, common, a common basis. Like you can talk about your family. You can talk about your school, you can talk about things that you have common experiences around. I mean, everybody, basic, most people anyway, love their family and have a story about their family. And you can make connections on a human level um, before getting into issues. And, and, you know, that takes, you can, you, it's a process. It's a process. And I think the very first thing is that you really need to make connections. You can be friends with people who don't think like you. Um, you can be friends with um, people who disagree with you on different things, as long as you remember that there's that core of humanity and you can really make connections on that. Um, and, and so I think that's really always the first place to start is just where are, um, where are commonalities as humans um, that we can have a conversation about and get to know each other. Like I, I need to get to know you as a person before I can trust you on any sort of issue. Um, and so, you know, the conversations need to start somewhere. And I think that's just really a good place to start. Wonderful. Um, I think we're gonna move on to our last audience question. Uh, and we will go with, 
do. Uh, what is the one policy change that, if it were possible, would start to rebuild a civil society and more healthy political dialogue? Oh, wow. That's, I don't know if it'll take a policy. I think it takes all of us in this room. I don't think you can really legislate that. I think it is something, you know, where we need to hold our elected officials accountable to good policy, but it is something that we should each take on as a human being to have conversations with other human beings. Um, and so I'm, I'm not sure that I would say that, you know, there's an all encompassing policy or legislation that can actually be enacted that would make us do things um, because, you know, we're learning a lot of people don't like to be forced to do certain things. And so, um, I, I think we just need to start with conversations, we need to start with dialogue, we need to start with coming together, um, and then it, it's just something that we need to engage in um, on an individual and societal level. Wonderful. Uh, well, I think that's a really great message to end on, just to really focus on that connection between people and to still have that message of hope yeah uh, so it's with not, that, definitely not easy i mean yeah. i don't think there's nothing easy about it um but that is the hard work that we should require all of us in this room to be able to do mm -hmm. absolutely uh so thank you so much for answering our questions and the audience questions uh we are going to now move on to a video from senator tester um and I'm not totally sure how this part's going to go, but I'll um, th thank you so much for answering questions. Thank you for inviting me to share a few words with you today and congratulations on 40 years of service to our state. Thank you to Liz Albers and Alexa Runyon and all of the people involved with Monberg for your hard work and dedication to empowering the next generation of Montana leaders. Through organizing, voter registration, and your continued work on public policy in the last best place, you have emp empowered young Montanans in every corner of the state, preparing them for the challenges of tomorrow. I especially appreciate your work educating Montanans about the Blackfoot Clearwater Stewardship Act. And it's made a real difference in continuing to build public support for this proposal. With your help, I'm confident we'll get this legislation across the finish line and ensure that public lands are managed in the best interest of the public that owns them. I also want to thank and congratulate the group of 40 leaders, 40 years, many of whom I have worked with and many of whom I have made lasting impacts on our state. Your leadership has ensured that we will leave Montana better than we found it. And I appreciate your efforts. Thank you again for all that you do for our state and here's another 40 years of building up young leaders in big sky country. All right, thank you. You guys can hear me, yes? Okay, I think so. Sometimes my audio doesn't work. Um, thank you so much, Denise Duno, for coming, and Audrey for being our host, MCAT for streaming this, and everybody who has attended, and especially those who put in questions. We really appreciate it. Um, this has been a part of our 40th anniversary celebration. And as another part of our 40th anniversary celebration, we are also inviting you to become public interest partners with Montberg. Public interest partners are anybody who make monthly donations to support our organization. They are crucial to allowing us to continue to do the work we do, um, as they provide us with a more consistent stream of donations all year round. The team at Montberg does so much to educate voters, advocate for good pol public policy, and provides leadership experience to students here at UM and MSU. We ask that you all consider becoming public interest partners at $20 a month, and you can do so by going to our website, mtperg.org slash donate. Um, we are putting the link in the chat, and if somebody hasn't already, I will do that. Uh, we will also be having our fireside gathering outside at the Ten Spoons Winery next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Come join us to drink hot cocoa by the bonfire and catch up on all things Montford. It's going to be super fun. Um, yeah, there will be hot cocoa and a fire and alcohol if you're old enough. Along with that, your ballots have been mailed. Make sure you find them in your mailbox. Vote and turn them in by October 27th or bring them to the Missoula Elections Office at 140 North Russell Street by Election Day, November 2nd. Um, and thank you guys so much. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you so much to Denise Juno and thank you again to Audrey. Yay, Mount Perk. <laughs>